G'day, I'm Paul. This is one of the biggest SUVs I've driven in a while. It's the new Jeep Grand Cherokee L, which means it's a long boy. Um, there is actually a bigger version of this. It's called the Grand Wagoneer. And while we don't get that in Australia, that actually sits on a body on frame chassis. This one's unibody, but this is still absolutely enormous. This competes with things like the Hyundai Palisade, the Toyota Kluger, Amongst others, this is the top specification. It's called the Summit Reserve. What a fancy name. Price is just over $115,000. That's too expensive. The entire range kicks off at just over 80 grand. Today, we're going to do a detailed review of this car. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel, press the bell icon, because that'll tell you every single time we drive one of these. Let's talk exterior design. So you've got five external colors to pick from. All but white is gonna cost you $1,750, which is a lot of money, but I guess it is a lot of paint that you actually need to put on the car. Um, I love the design of this, I'm not gonna lie. I love the front, I love the back. It really just has fantastic proportions. Down the front here, you've got that trademark seven pillar Jeep grille. Jeep logo up the top there and a camera built in just here for your 360 camera. Radar down the bottom there and then this piano black section. I really like just the way that it looks, I don't know, tough and stylish at the same time. They haven't compromised any of that sort of Jeep ruggedness in terms of the design. And it has a real presence in person as well. It turns a lot of heads. So it is quite an impressive and imposing vehicle out on the road. Over here in terms of your headlights, full LED headlights with headlight washer. Uh, down the bottom there, you've got front parking sensors as well. We'll whip around to the side. Now, this rides on 21 inch alloy wheels. This is an interesting setup because this particular spec has air suspension, it has semi-adaptive damping as well, so it should mean that it actually rides nicely out on the road. This actually had some ride and handling tuning work done here in Australia prior to the launch of the car, so uh, it should be tailored for our roads there. The Summit Reserve has body coloured uh, wheel arch guards there. A little sort of uh, side locator lamp, Grand Cherokee lettering down the side there as well. In terms of ground clearance, this being the top spec and having the adjustable air suspension, it can rise up to 276 millimetres of ground clearance, which is actually pretty decent, and that improves your approach and departure angles as well, which I'll run over later. Uh, over here, you have piano black up the top there, and then you have a camera built into here, plus that uh, indicator in the wing mirror. You've got these chrome, uh, sort of chrome-esque garnishes up the side of the car there, and then a black roof, which I think looks fantastic. Roof rails there, privacy glass, and then come around to the back. Now around the back here, you've got a set of LED tail lights, the Summit Reserve badge just here, real exhaust outlets hidden under there. Now, another interesting element here, you've got two sets of cameras. So you've got this one up here, and that also has a little washer built into it as well. And then you've got this one down here as well, that has a washer as well. So. When the weather is like this and the back gets all dirty, you don't need to actually stop the car to clean your cameras. You can just give them a squirt and they will become clean. There's a brake light integrated here, plus a shark fin aerial up the top. Now, let me know what you reckon about the design in the comments section below. I do want to point something out, and you may have noticed this as we've been going around the car here, but some of these panels just don't line up. Like, have a look at this. This is out of alignment there. On this side here, that paint or whatever the, the sort of wrapping on this is, is bubbling. And around other parts of the car as well, the panels are out of alignment. So I don't know if that's just this vehicle. Uh, it doesn't have all that many Ks on it, but it is pretty disappointing to see that it has been assembled to look like that. If I was paying 115, 120 grand for this, I'd be pretty disappointed with uh, the way this appears at the moment in terms of the panel alignment. So we're inside the Grand Cherokee L. Whew, this looks nice. So let's start off with the key. Here it is here. So you've got unlock, lock, you have a remote start function, a boot function, and then on the back there you have Jeep. This is a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. Uh, grab the door handle. Once you're inside, you have a push button start just up here. So this actually all just looks really stunning to me. And in the Summit Reserve, you can get this interior color as well. And it really just blends nicely with that walnut wood grain trim along the dashboard there. The only downside is the seat is already getting pretty dirty and this car's done all of 4,000 kilometers. So that is worth keeping in mind. If you do go for one of these exotic seat colors, you really do have to stay on top of keeping it clean. Otherwise it's gonna look like a, 
you know, a 40 year old truck by the time you're done with it. Uh, along the top of the dashboard there, that looks great as well. So it's sort of leather material lined. You've got these materials down the side there that are soft to the touch, a good spot to lean your knee on. And then you get more of that wood grain trim along the doors and the diamond quilt stitching there as well. So it is really beautifully presented. And I think, um, you know, this actually looks very much like it's worth its price tag. But when you do take a closer look, there are some things here that stand out that I'm not a huge fan of. There is piano black all over the place. And again, it's only 4,000 kilometers old, but it's all scratched up and it's just impossible to keep clean. I really don't understand why they keep using that type of material. And then in addition to that, some of the, the build around here isn't fantastic. So these things are just sort of loose around the steering wheel. This stuff here squeaks when you're moving it around. This is really hard to open. You have to kind of push it in really hard for it to do anything and, and this one here when you close it you have to really get into it as well so it's disappointing there that this um yeah i don't know it just doesn't feel like they've gone to enough testing here to make sure this is durable over time which is just a little bit disappointing but uh it is what it is i guess now what about your touch points so this here is soft to the touch soft on the door as well how soft is it well we've got our durometer we've tested the main surfaces in this cabin if you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before have a look at the link in the description so i kind of mentioned the build quality stuff just before but our usual shape test has that sort of wobbling a little bit in the center there but the rest of this feels fairly solid and our door test get ready for some beeping yeah, it feels really nice and solid when you open and close the door. Let's talk about infotainment. Now, this is one of the standout features of the Grand Cherokee L. It's basically the newest version of Jeep's Uconnect infotainment system. That infotainment system has generally actually been pretty good, and this is just the latest and greatest version of it. Um, now, how big is it? So 10.1 inch display, it appears here. You then have a screen ahead of the driver as well that I'll run you through briefly, and that displays 10.25 inch. So this is your home screen. You can configure what appears here on the home screen and, and make it look exactly how you want it to look uh, pretty sort of easily. The thing I find interesting is they obviously didn't do the conversion from left-hand drive to right-hand drive very well because the uh, steering wheel heater button is up on that side, which is the passenger side, instead of it being on the driver's side, which is a little bit strange. I would have thought they'd localize that so that it actually works properly. Um, in terms of your audio, you have AM, FM, and DAB digital radio. That's all plumbed through a 19 speaker Macintosh branded sound system. Sound system's great. It sounds fantastic, especially in this big cabin. It's kind of like a theater in here. It's got plenty of bass and I really like the way that it sounds. You get inbuilt satellite navigation. Uh, the inbuilt satellite Satellite navigation works well. It's nice and fast and sharp. In terms of smartphone mirroring, you have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. So basically a full screen integration, nice and fast and snappy there as well. I'll show you what Android Auto looks like. It is also wireless and also full screen. That's nice and snappy as well. Very impressive. Up the top here, you've got the ability to add shortcuts as well so you can get to certain places without having to sort of flick around all the menus. This does have some really interesting features though. So if you have kids in the car, which is probably what you're going to do, you're gonna have the ability to watch them. And I know it sounds a little bit creepy, but let me explain where this is actually useful. So if you go to fam cam, I love that noise, um, you can click on any of the seats to get a zoomed in view of exactly where the kids are sitting. Now, this is important because for me, with a, a rearward facing child seat in this position here, so the, the rear passenger seat, I have to use a mirror to see if my daughter's asleep. Uh, this, on the other hand, I can just press a button and then the camera looks to see whether she's asleep. So I love that feature. This is going to be really handy for families who have babies in some of these rows and they wanna see what they're up to, or if they wanna see who is arguing here in the third row, and who needs to get in trouble for slapping their sibling or something like that. Uh, this is also where you can access your other cameras. This feature is really handy too. So a push of that button drops the headrests in the third row. So if you do need better visibility out the back, it is pretty straightforward just to hit that and then they disappear. So a uh, very impressive setup and I love that they've thought about all of the family features here on the infotainment system. Now the screen ahead of the driver. So pretty straightforward. You can configure all your different views there. This particular car has an option pack that includes a wireless phone charger, a 
head-up display. Uh, it's meant to have a, a passenger screen, but I can't see it there, and perhaps this is something that is missing due to the semiconductor shortage. Uh, but it does have this feature, which is night vision. So looking out the front there, I can see the night vision camera. You may think this is stupid and it is cool to see like where heat sources are off other cars and stuff like that, but this is actually more useful for pedestrians. When you do have a pedestrian walk in front of the car, it will highlight them for you, especially useful if you're driving out in the country and you can't see animals and other warm blooded creatures. Now, what about your safety tech? You have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You have an auto dimming rear vision mirror, but it also doubles as a digital rear mirror as well, which is pretty impressive. You have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant. You have rear cross traffic alert, blind spot monitoring built into the wing mirror. Now, in addition to all this stuff, uh, you have radar cruise control, but the Summit Reserve also comes with this highway assistant. Uh, it's really not a very good system. So I tested this out on the way here today and it just won't stay in the lane. Like it, it kind of stays in the lane sometimes, but it will then veer out of the lane all on its own. Uh, yeah, it's just a really poorly calibrated system. So it's pretty disappointing that that doesn't work any better. On the parking front, you have front and rear parking sensors. The Summit Reserve also gets a 360 camera. This is what it looks like. So that is your top down view over here. It's okay, it's kind of stitched together. You can kind of see what's around the car. Uh, that's your rear view. You can then go wide angle for the rear view wide angle for the front view, direct out the front there, or have a look at this, you can go super sized for the rear view and that resolution is excellent. You can clearly see what's going on there. You even have a zoom function as well. If you're hitching a trailer, you can look out the front too, see the wheel guides as you're driving off roads, so that will come in handy. And then you can press this as well to clean the camera too. So very impressive. Moving on to practicality, we'll start off with your connectivity. So uh, in here, you've got uh, USB-C and USB-A, two sets of those, an auxiliary port, you've got a 12 volt outlet. You also have the optional wireless phone charger. Uh, in terms of where you're gonna store your phone and stuff like that, well, it can live down there on the wireless phone charger or alternatively, you can stick it here on the cup holder if you want. Uh, speaking of cup holder, holds the coffee in nicely, but it is a deep hole. So your coffee kind of disappears down there, but Look, it's not the end of the world. You've got these rubber grips in there as well to hold your drinks as you go. Normal bottle fits in without any dramas. Fits inside the door too. Let's try our big bottle. No, it does actually fit. I'm just gonna lie there for a second. It does actually fit, but you have to wedge it in. I would have thought this being an American car, it would fit, you know, like that's the size of a typical American coffee. So it should fit that, but uh, that doesn't, Right, you've got to kind of wedge it in. I wouldn't love to put something sort of without flexible bits on the edge of it in there. Um, other storage, uh, you've got this set of console here. You have a section up the top there for keys and bits and pieces, and then a section beneath it. That's actually pretty decent. It's nice and deep. You've got a glove box over here as well that is reasonably sized too. No sunglasses holder, but this is where you'll find the controls for that big panoramic glass sunroof as well. Okay, moving on to comfort, you have quad zone automatic climate controls. So two zones up the front here. You also have heated and cooled seats up the front with a heated steering wheel. You have massage function for both the front seats with memory, 12 way electric seat adjustments. You can go forwards, backwards, backrest can go forwards, backwards. You can lift the base, you can extend the front section, you can adjust your lumbar. There is so much adjustment here. Love the seats as well, they are so comfortable. So they've got these perforations for the cooling. Summit written in them up the top there and plenty of bolstering as well. Beautiful leather material too. So they are very nicely presented. So very impressed with that. Steering wheel offers both tilt and reach adjustment. It's electrically adjustable. And on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Okay, second row, Grand Cherokee L. Uh, let's start off with our room. So knee room is reasonable, toe room is okay, uh, head room is not too bad. I just would have thought there'd be just a little bit more room here. So yes, I have my seat quite far back, but if you have a look at that knee room, it's sort of, it's fine, but it's nothing amazing. Same with toe room, I would have expected just maybe a little bit more there so I can stretch out. Uh, but for the most part, it is actually not too bad back here. Creature comfort, so you've got map pockets in the back of the seats. You have your third and fourth zone of climate control, heating and cooling for the two outboard seats. You also have air vents down here, USB-C and USB-A connectivity, plus an actual power outlet as well. 
The seats themselves move forwards and backwards. You can afford a bit more room for the third row. You can also tilt them as well if you want to recline a little bit. Center armrest here with two cup holders. Bottle fits in there nicely with those rubber sections. This fits inside the door as well, although it's a little bit of a squeeze. I'm going to call out here as well that you have ISOFIX points on all three of these seats and then top tether points on all five seats back here, which is great. So if you do have a whole bunch of kids, you're going to be able to accommodate everybody nicely. Um, you've got these window shades, they're manual. Let's do our window test. Let's see if it goes all the way down. Ha, Bob's your uncle all the way down and it's auto up and down as well. Very impressive. And finally, some cooling vents just here on the B pillar as well, which is good news. So third row, given there was slightly less space than anticipated here in the second row, let's see what it's like in the third row. So uh, there's a couple of ways of getting in. You can just drop that seat and climb over, or they've got this clever mechanism that lifts the seat, slides it forward so that you can, even as an adult, just climb all the way in. So we'll give that a shot. All right, so let me slide this back. I'm going to try and put it like all the way back. So that position there is the default, but I have stacks of knee room there. Um, Sean, I might get you to slide that back all the way so that we have maximum leg room for the second row. There we go, that'll do. So even there with this all the way back, I actually have an okay amount of room. My knees are sort of just touching that. Toe room is limited, but headroom is pretty reasonable. So very impressed with that. Other creature comforts back here, you've got air vents, USB-C, USB-A, cup holders on both sides. It's actually a really nice place to be seated, even for adults, which I'm pretty surprised by. You don't really have a lot of SUVs in this segment focusing on adults for the third row. So yeah, big tick there for Jeep. Let's sort cargo space. So being such a long vehicle, They've actually done wonders here with cargo space and making this actually usable. So in this area here alone, you have just under 500 litres of cargo space, which is pretty awesome. I'll show you what it looks like with the bag in there. Fits it in nicely without any problems. Beneath the cargo floor, you've also got some storage away from prying eyes. It's also where you'll find your jack. Now, the interesting thing is um, you would expect something like this, which is off-road focused, to have you know, full-size spare, but unfortunately under the car, it's like a steel spare. It's only 245 mil wide. The rest of the tires are 275. So it is strange that they've gone with, I don't know, such a small tire. Why not just have a full-size spare under there? So uh, very odd choice. Uh, in terms of your other features back here, you've got a 12 volt outlet off to the side. And then in addition to that, you also have all the buttons for dropping all of these seats. So these two are dropped and also raised using these electronic controls. So they lower out of the way. Once they are out of the way, that produces a space that is just under 1400 liters in size. So it's a nice big open cavernous area. And if you want even more space, you can drop the second row from here too. By dropping that, that expands the space to over 2000 liters. Like it is an absolutely whopper space here. So it is pretty versatile there when it comes to storage. Righto, so we've just hit the road in the Grand Cherokee. Now, unfortunately for the Australian market, the only engine we get at the moment is a naturally aspirated petrol V6. And I know what you're thinking, it's a 2.2, 2.3 tonne car, surely a petrol V6 isn't adequate. <laughs> You'd be right. It produces 210 kilowatts of power and 344 newton metres of torque. It really is just an insignificant amount of power and torque for a vehicle this size. That affects things like towing capacity here on the top spec. It can only tow just under 2.3 tonnes, which again, is just so substandard compared to the previous generation of the Grand Cherokee, which was able to do three and a half tonnes uh, brake towing capacity, which is exactly what you need in this segment when you are towing things like a caravan and big old things like that. Uh, it's all mated to an eight speed automatic transmission. How does that all feel behind the wheel? We'll give it a little punch here. The gearbox itself is actually nice and sharp and crisp and quick. The problem is that the engine just needs to rev and make a whole bunch of noise whenever it does anything and that's like overtaking you will just hear it for days uh taking off at the traffic lights you really have to stay stuck into it uh, because it is very peaky and that means that it has to be high up in its rev band to actually achieve anything meaningful 
On the upside, it is made into a permanent four-wheel drive system. So that means it's constantly active. It's not one of those on-demand systems. So you're always sending torque to uh, the four wheels and some variation of it. And that means it does feel somewhat sure-footed out on the road. Uh, when we go for a bit more of a fang, uh, I'll be interested to see how it goes here in the wet conditions because it is sopping wet today. There are patches of dry on the road here, but for the most part, it is pretty wet and we're running a bit of a highway terrain tire that is a bridge between on-road and off-road sort of capable. Now Jeep claims a combined fuel economy of under 11 litres per 100 k's but we're currently seeing on an average of 11.7 and that's with a good mix of highway and uh, city driving and also a bit of sporty driving around here this morning. So look, I'm okay with that figure. Generally a petrol V6 is going to use a whole lot of fuel especially when it is made into something this size. The good news on the fuel economy though is that it has a fuel tank that measures 104 litres so that means that you can stick a whole bunch of juice in it and you're not going to have to stop all the time to fill it up but it is going to be quite thirsty in the process. GP is actually working on a turbocharged six-cylinder petrol engine that I'm hoping we get for the Australian market. There is a petrol V8 available in the States but we miss out on that locally. So what is the ride like? Let's dial it up to 130 k's an hour. That is the maximum legal speed in parts of Australia. We'll send it over our sine waves. See what it feels like. <laughs> you can hear it making a whole bunch of noise to get there. Okay. It actually feels pretty good, so that's commendable there. So it has really good body control at that top end. Uh, in and around town, the ride isn't fantastic. It's nowhere near as comfortable as it could be. And especially when you compare it to some of the competitors in this segment, a lot of them really focus on quality of ride and, and a softer ride. This is strangely firm at the front end. So the front suspension is really firm and then the back is softer. So when you do hit things like uh, speed bumps and stuff like that, you feel a big shunt from the front and then it's softer at the rear, strangely. And that results in a ride that isn't overly comfortable. Uh, so I think it could have a little bit more comfort dialed into it, especially when you are using air suspension and a sort of semi-adaptive damping setup. You've got a set of drive modes here, sport, auto, snow, sand, mud, and rock. Let's pop it into sport mode. So that uh, immediately puts the suspension down to the aero setting. It puts the gearbox into sport mode. Like I said, it is wet here today. <laughs> Yes, it is wet here today, and this is uh, this is kind of, yeah, I don't know, these tyres don't seem to love this kind of wet terrain here, and the car is kind of understeering a little bit, and it feels big out on the road. So, steering doesn't have a great deal of feel to it, it's kind of a little bit numb, it's artificial in a lot of ways, and yeah, I mean, there's no hiding the fact that this is an enormous SUV, so you're not really going to ever get that sporty feel out of it. it makes me wonder if they're actually going to do an SRT version of this, because, yeah, I don't know, inherently it just feels a little sketchy as the speed picks up, uh, especially here on the wet stuff, so, yeah, I don't know, I'm not sort of overly impressed with it. Dial it onto our back straight. I'm keen to see what this engine feels like if you're going to do something like an overtake or something like that. Because while it is noisy and peaky, the good part is that when it does get up into the higher part of that rev band, it actually has a little bit of punch to it. So here's our back straight. I'll just punch that throttle. Yeah, look, it's making a whole lot of noise and not really moving all that quickly. So. Yeah, look, it's good, but not amazing. I think this desperately needs that turbo six cylinder. Jeep doesn't have an official zero to 100 time for the Grand Cherokee L, but this is how it went up against our stopwatch. Let's talk about some of the off-road specs. So I mentioned earlier that you do have the air suspension set up and when you do put that into its highest off-road setting, you're getting almost 280 millimeters of ground clearance, which is excellent. Summit Reserve with that fancy suspension also gets a better approach and departure angle. And that comes in at 28.2 degrees for the approach angle and a little under 24 degrees for the departure angle. Now that of course is the angle of the face you can hit 
uh, when you're going forwards and then the angle of the face you can hit when you're going backwards effectively. That is your approach and departure angle. In terms of your other off-road equipment, it has the ability to lock the center diff, so it's sending 50% of torque to the front, 50% of torque to the rear. You also have a low range mode and a hill descent control. Then these other drive modes as well will configure the stability control and what that does when this is actually off-road. Finally, 610 millimeter weighting depth. So that is the depth you can go to before you start breaking things under the bonnet. Now, I know you're wondering, um, you know, big premium SUV, is the road noise premium? Um, look, we're doing sort of highway speeds at the moment on a coarse chip road. It's not too bad. So it's not serene like something like a Mercedes Benz, but it is nice and quiet inside the cabin. What about your visibility? So this is a big bus, I'm not gonna lie about that. I can see clearly down the front there, the wing mirrors are huge. Visibility out the back isn't too bad. I mentioned earlier that you can drop those rear headrests on the third row to give you improved visibility, and that works really well in that setting there. Uh, and aside from that, you've got a semi-autonomous parking feature and the reverse view camera, the surround view camera rather, is fantastic. So it means that parking this, despite its size, is actually not too hard of a task. And your turning circle, it's just under 12 metres, so about what I would expect with a car of this size. So the Grand Cherokee L, I've got to point something out. So when we started filming, it was wet and it was a little bit sketchy on those tyres, but then it dried out and I went for a bit more of an aggressive fang. And it's actually quite dynamic for a vehicle of its size. I think the tyres just aren't really suited all that well to wet weather driving, but when it does dry up, it is actually somewhat engaging to drive. That's why some bits of our footage are on a dry road and some are wet, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, but the Grand Cherokee L, would I buy one? Uh, the answer is no, and I'll explain why. So I love the practicality, it's huge inside, the tech is fantastic, that camera for the kids is really cool and functional, and it's got plenty of room inside as well, and I think it looks great too. But ultimately, it's let down by a couple of things. The towing capacity, when the previous one did three and a half tonne towing capacity, you can't go backwards now to 2.2 2 tonnes. Uh, then on top of that, the engine, it just really isn't suitable for a vehicle this size, and it just doesn't gel well with this application. They really need to sort out that Turbo 6 and bring that to Australia, or even the naturally aspirated V8. I think people would be happy to pay for it. You just need to offer it, not just a single V6 option. And then there's the build quality. I can't talk about other Grand Cherokee L vehicles, but this one here that we're testing is built pretty poorly. And I think if I was paying that kind of money, I'd be pretty disappointed in the way that it's been assembled. So there you go. If you are in the market for one, I would encourage you to wait until they bring a decent engine out here. Then that's going to address a lot of the problems that the car has. And then it's actually going to be probably a pretty decent purchase. So let me know in the comments section below. Have you bought one of these? Does the V6 get better with time? Is it like a fine wine? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Now, if you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.